All right, I think we're about ready to get started now. So I'll ask everyone to take your seats. Um, we will have some opportunity for catching up and getting to know one another at lunch. Great, everybody, thank you. So I wanted to say good morning. My name is Sharon Ward. I'm the director of the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center based here in Harrisburg. And I want to welcome all of you in attendance this morning. Thank you for traveling through the snow and the ice and the sleet and everything else in order to be with us today. And I also want to welcome our PCN audience. This is, I believe, the eighth annual budget summit that we've had. And over the years, we have grown. Um, and the theme this year is the challenges ahead. Uh, like the rest of the nation, we have begun to recover from the recession, but we still have lingering recession effects. And um, today we really want to examine what, how we're doing, um, what's left, and what the implications of the recession and policies that have been enacted over the years mean for Pennsylvania citizens, our communities, and our economy. So we have a num we've got a really great panel, um, a number of terrific workshops. Uh, we have a number of uh, national experts with us from across the country um, in education, in health care, poverty, communications, and on state and, and uh, local tax structures, and you'll be hearing from them today, as well as our local policy experts and many policy participants. And we have a great panel of state lawmakers that um, will start immediately after uh, the, the budget presentation today. So as always, our goal is to provide you with a broad overview of the state budget to provide historical perspective to help you to understand how this budget matches or doesn't prior year's budgets and also to help you to be as our most important goal informed advocates and um, active participants in the public policy process so we have a lot for you today and what I'd like to do is two things first I'd like to thank our funders who make this all possible, and those include the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Stoneman Family Fund, the Heinz Endowments, and the William Penn Foundation. Without their generous support, we would not be here. And let me now introduce our great research director, Michael Wood, who will walk you through our state budget overview. Michael. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so today I'm going to walk you through the budget and kind of talk about some of the things that are in the governor's uh, proposed budget and what it means for Pennsylvanians, and uh, we can have some questions at the end. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, as Sharon said recently. Uh, we are a nonprofit based here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, we focus on uh, budget and tax analysis at the state level and looking at revenue adequacy and the impact of tax and budget um, proposals on uh, working Pennsylvanians. Next slide, please. Uh, whenever we talk about budgets, one thing that's very important to remember are budgets are statements of values. Uh, after they're passed, they're in, set in time forever of what we felt was important at the time. Uh, while they fluctuate from year to year uh, based on tax revenue growth and mandated spending, at the end of the day, they're fixed statements of priorities. How we manage these competing priorities each year says something about us as a society. Uh, rather than emphasizing what we can afford from one year to the next, we should always keep in mind what we should be doing to make sure our kids are getting a decent education, our elderly are getting care they need, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is, uh, gives you an idea of like what's happened with Pennsylvania's uh, taxes over time, state taxes as a share of, of state personal income compared to the United States. Uh, Pennsylvania is the line in blue. Uh, the red line with dots in it is the national line. Uh, Pennsylvania is, over time has been in a very average state compared to other states in terms of how much of the economy comes back to the state in taxes. Uh, it's been around 6% over the, uh, the course of the last 25 years. Um, 
we've been uh, typically a little bit lower than the national average from 1980 through 2003, and then since then we've kind of gone back and forth be between being higher and lower than the national average. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, similar story uh, when you look at state expenditures, and this includes money that all the money that comes into the state includes money that the state raises itself, and then also federal money that comes in that goes back out, particularly in the terms of Medicaid. Uh, in this sense, Pennsylvania has been uh, lower than the national average much of the time in the last uh, 25 years. Uh, at 30, 28 years out of the last 35, we've been below the national average. Uh, since the last recession, uh, Pennsylvania has been a little bit higher than uh, the rest of the country in terms of general expenditures. Some of that probably has to do with the recession not being as difficult in Pennsylvania as it was in other places. Uh, next slide, please. So coming into the budget this year, uh, from many different uh, perspectives, we've been hearing about what a difficult budget year this was going to be, uh, that there were a lot of challenges uh, and that had to be solved to be able to balance the budget despite the growing economy. And I'm just going to walk you through a couple of these. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the main things is unemployment in the United States and in Pennsylvania remain high. Coming out of the recession, we, we're adding jobs, but not anywhere nearly as quickly as we need to to get back to pre-recession levels. Uh, coming out of the, during the recession, as you can see, the um, the larger box on the right of of the charts uh, that's the Great Recession, the stuff in yellow. Uh, during that time, Pennsylvania, uh, the unemployment increased dramatically as it did in the rest of the United States, but it didn't increase as quickly as it did in other places. So Pennsylvania didn't lose as many jobs in the recession as a share of our uh, total state. We had about, uh, the unemployment rate was about a percent lower than uh, the United States average coming out of the recession. And, over, but since the end of the recession, that Pennsylvania advantage in unemployment has been shrinking. And now for, since uh, 2000, mid-2012, uh, more often than not, Pennsylvania's rate has been higher than the national rate in unemployment. Unemployment's important because it has a lot of impacts on the state budget. Um, on the tax side, uh, personal income tax and sales tax are, are driven by how many people have jobs and how many people have wages. Uh, you know, they're realty transfer taxes when people buy houses. Um, you know, so much of our economy is based on consumer spending when you have a lot of people un unemployed. It really uh, hurts the tax side of, of the state budget. On the expenditure side, you know, there are so many programs that the state offers for uh, people that are unemployed and in terms of unemployment insurance, uh, health care. Uh, so the demands increase when there are more people that are unemployed. It make, means that the expenditure side of the budget is bigger because pe there's more demands on it. So you kind of have a mismatch in terms of more services are being, people, more people need services, fewer dollars to pay for them. So budget problems in the state. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide is from uh, the mid-year budget review that uh, Budget Secretary uh, Zogby did in December. Uh, it looked at, this was before the budget came out, it kind of laid out the challenges that the administration saw going into this next year. And uh, the main thing right off the bat was that revenues uh, were not expected to grow as quickly as even mandated spending. Uh, things that the state had to spend money, that would, the state has to spend money on that were increasing. Um, these were initial estimates, and they've since changed since the budget came out, but it, it gives you an idea of like what we were looking at. Uh, initially, there were about $1.6 billion in mandated spending increases. Um, those are the bars on the right. Uh, they're hard to read on here. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, the, the green bar at the bottom is the increase in the pension costs for the state. Uh, the purple bar is the um, FMAP increase. The, the federal government's match of Medicaid decreased in this coming budget, so the state had to pick up more costs for that. Uh, the red is an increase in just regular Medicare costs that the state normally would have to pay for. Uh, the blue is an increase in debt service, like the debt the state pays. Uh, that increases by about a billion dollars in this budget. And then the yellow is uh, the increase in the Department of Corrections. Uh, just the cost of running our presence gets more expensive every year. Uh, so comparing that to the bar on the other side, that's the increase. That's a that's assuming a three percent growth in revenue, uh, based on what the economy's been like. Three percent is kind of what an average rate of growth would be with a slowly growing economy. The gap between these two is, you know, eight hundred million dollars. This doesn't include any non-mandated spending increases. So if you ha want to put more money into basic education funding, special education, colleges. Um, 
you know, human services, anything, that makes that gap even bigger. Uh, so going into the budget, people were talking about about a billion dollars uh, budget gap between uh, revenues and expenditures uh, with just even very modest increases in other spending. Next slide, please. Um, the Independent Fiscal Office uh, does a report. This report came out in November looking at uh, the state's revenue growth versus what planned expenditures are likely to be over time. Uh, and they found that over the next five years, Pennsylvania has what they call a structural deficit, meaning that revenues aren't expected to grow as quickly as expenditure increases are. And we start off in the current fiscal year with about $800 million uh, below what revenue growth was supposed to be. Over time, that gap gets bigger, uh, up to over $2 billion by the time you get five years out. So the state has a problem uh, balancing its books right now, paying for services that are very important to us. Uh, our revenues are not sufficient to be able to cover that, and that problem gets bigger over time if we don't do anything about it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another problem that we've had that's been, uh, that came to light in January for the first time this year is uh, the state's revenue picture of like meeting monthly revenue targets is starting to miss forecasts. Up through the first half of the year, they were right at, um, at uh, the fiscal estimates for the monthly estimates. Uh, but in January, they, in de December and in January, they fell behind, and now the state's $41 million below uh, official estimate. $41 million is a very small amount in the overall amount of the budget and very easily managed. But we are at the point where our revenues, um, we have the, the two largest revenue months of, of collections of revenue are in March and April. So this revenue gap is likely to get a bit bigger. Uh, we don't know how much bigger at this point. Um, if it remains below about $250 million, uh, it seems like the state has things in, in place that they would be able to manage that. If it gets bigger than that, then there, are some, there could be some serious problems with next year's budget. Um, even with that, the state's projecting that they're going to finish this, this, the budget that was just released uh, estimates that we're going to finish the year uh, right at budget estimate in terms of revenue. Um, it's probably going to be you know, at least $100 million below that. It has some minor implications on the budget, but um, it's something that we really need to watch in the next few months and could be getting worse uh, just due to the way that the revenue estimates were put together. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, governor released his budget on uh, the first week of February, and it's a very different kind of budget than what we've seen in the last few years. And I'm going to walk you through what the major points of the budget are and some of the challenges we see going forward. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this looks at what the state, what the general fund, which is kind of when people talk about the budget, it's usually the general fund. That's where most of the normal spending, uh, where there is like kind of any negotiation on what gets spent, it happens normally within the general fund. Um, so for uh, this next fiscal year, Governor Corbett's spending plan is uh, $29.4 billion. Um, that's an increase of, oh, I have that on the next slide. Um, and with that, the funding areas that, uh, that are paid for within the general fund, um, about $10.3 billion goes for pre-K through 12 education. That's the biggest slice of the major departments. That's 35%, so about one in three dollars gets spent on that. Uh, $6.7 billion on medical assistance, the state's Medicaid program and long-term living program. Uh, about $4.7 billion on other human services. Uh, $1.6 billion on higher education, and that includes spending in, on our universities and FIA. Uh, $1 billion in debt service. About $2 billion in the Department of Corrections. And then everything else that the general fund pays for you know, whether it's environmental programs, whether it's agriculture programs, uh, uh, economic development, um, grants uh, t for the arts, everything like that, um, just even regular administration, $2.9 billion for that other slice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this chart looks at what's happened to general fund spending over time. Uh, the, the blue bars on this are just regular state dollars. Um, in, during the recession, uh, the federal government provided temporary funding, what's called ERA funding, that helped the state not cut its budget dramatically during the recession as tax revenues fell off. Uh, Pennsylvania used that, the, these federal dollars from 2008 through 2010-11, uh, and those are in the yellow. Uh, once those went away, the state dollars had to pick up the rest, and um, since then, we've seen, in 2010-11, the total amount of spending in the general fund ended up dropping, 
because there wasn't enough, uh, there weren't enough state dollars to pay for that at the time. And since then, they've been increasing as the economy's expanded. Um, in this one, the um, from 1314 to 1415, the spending is projected to increase by 3.3 percent, or 927 billion dollars. Uh, certainly, uh, the highest level that we've spent since uh, before the recession. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide looks at where the ta where tax dollars and the revenue comes from to be able to pay for spending in the general fund. Uh, we have the two major sources of revenue are the personal income tax, which makes up about 41 percent of all tax revenue all revenue within the general fund. Um, that is uh, about I think it's about 11 billion. Oh, it's, 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 I'm sorry, 12.7 billion dollars uh, from personal income tax. $9.5 billion in sales tax, uh, corporate taxes, uh, including the corporate net income tax, the shrinking capital stock and franchise tax, and all other corporate taxes make up about $5 billion. Um, it's like 16% of the budget. And uh, all other taxes make up 9% of the budget. Um, in, one thing that's important in this budget, uh, more so than in other recent budgets, are the non-tax revenue. Uh, those are $787 million this year. Uh, they increase 63% uh, from last year's budget due to uh, transfer of uh, funds from uh, the oil and gas lease fund that's being proposed by the governor and uh, a one-time revenue bump in, term in changing the state's unclaimed property law. Uh, next slide, please. So this looks at what's happened to state revenues over time. Um, the, the yellow box is the recession. Um, the blue bars are tax revenues. And the red line at the top of that, sorry, it's more complicated than it needs to be, uh, are total revenues. And that kind of shows the gap between tax revenues and uh, when we have non-tax revenues. Um, as you can see in the recession, we saw a big decline in tax rev in overall revenue. The state in, in one fiscal year lost $2 billion of revenue and had to figure out a way to balance the budget. Um, and then in the next year, as we, and then we saw tax revenues drop again the next year after that. Uh, in 2009-10, there was a lot of money to balance the budget. There were a lot of non-tax revenues that were used to help balance the budget. That included bringing money from other state funds uh, to be able to backfill um, lost tax revenue in the general fund so spending could uh, so programs didn't have to be cut uh, what we see over time since then is that the economy has been expanding uh, tax revenues have been growing uh, not particularly fast um, in 14-15 uh, the budget uh, assumes that there's going to be a larger revenue growth than what we've seen in the last few years Overall, a 4.9% increase in general fund revenue, 3.9% uh, increase in the tax revenue that the state sees. Um, that's up from 1.6% in overall revenue growth this current year. So much healthier growth planned for next year. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said before, this is really a change in course from budgets we've seen in the last few years, uh, you know, partly due to the fact that there's more expected revenue, that's, so the state has more funding to be able to pay for some of these things. Uh, there are a number of programs that have gone you know, years of flat funding or funding cuts that start to see some funding increases this year um, in, you know, in terms of economic development. Special education sees an increase for the first time in a number of years. Um, healthcare and human services programs. So all around the budget, you know, in previous, in the last previous budgets, there have been a lot of, you go through and you find cuts all over the place in terms, in the budget. This one is different. It doesn't seem, there are not that many programs that have cuts as compared to previous years in particular. Um, there's also uh, more investment in infrastructure in this budget uh, in terms of uh, parks and forests and uh, transportation with the transportation law that was passed uh, recently. There's more money for uh, helping keep up the roads and uh, other infrastructure. Uh, one other thing that's in this budget that's unusual, that's different from the last few years, is that there are no new tax cuts that are proposed in this budget. Uh, there are also uh, no real permanent revenue raising, so no new taxes on, on the other side. Uh, so it's kind of a tax-free budget in, in that sense. There is, that doesn't mean that there aren't tax cuts that take effect this year. Uh, in the last previous years, there have been a number of laws that have been passed that uh, passed tax cuts into the future that didn't take effect for a year, two years, three years. And some of those start taking hold this year, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, looking at the education budget, uh, you know, classroom spending increases by $251 million to $5.9 billion in this budget. Uh, it's an increase of 4.5% over uh, the 2314. And pre-K uh, pre spending, including classrooms, uh, other programs, the state's, pension, the state's pension payments on school employees, uh, that increases by $363 million from the current fiscal year to $10.3 billion. That's an increase of 3.7%. Uh, higher education, including funding for the state re the state related colleges, Penn State, uh, Pitt, Temple, and Lincoln University, the state system of higher education, community colleges, and uh, funding at FIA, that increases by 1.5 percent, and that's due to a program that's uh, in uh, FIA that increased everything else is flat funded from the last year, um, and then. Uh, but when you look back to 2010-11, uh, some of these areas still have, there were cuts that were made in 2011-12 that we still haven't made up for. Uh, particularly in classroom funding, we're still 6.7% uh, down from where we were uh, prior to the cuts. And then higher education still sees much uh, bigger cuts of 16.3% um, since that time. Overall, um, pre-K through 12 spending does show an increase during this time of 4%. A lot of that's due to pensions, uh, the increasing cost of pensions for the state, uh, which I will show you on the next slide. So if you look at what's happened to the state's pension contribution, this looks at just at the state, uh, the school employees. It's the same uh, sort of uh, deal for state employees, but those are distributed throughout the whole budget. In, uh, you can look at the school employees by looking at, at one line item. And we have seen that these have increased uh, pretty dramatically, and this is, uh, you know, this is not a surprise. Um, we have uh, known that this was an issue going forward for a number of years and been trying to take care of it. Um, in, during this time period, we've seen, um, you know, uh, from 1314 to 1415, the budget proposes an increase of $105 million of state dollars. It's an increase of 10.5% from the current year. Uh, compared to what the payments were back in 2010-11, it is an $825 million increase, um, in this case a 286% in, uh, increase. That has to do with uh, what's happened over uh, time with the state's funding of this, and I'll talk about that in a second. Next slide, please. So, you know, pensions are going to be something that are going to be talked about in this budget and are going to be talked about in future budgets. Um, it's, it's an escalating cost for the state, but it's one that has a long history and there, it's going to take a long time to have it be fixed. And there's not really an easy answer on that other than just make sure that we're paying down the debt on the, um, on the pension costs. Um, so the lines in blue on this show what the state's projected um, debt service is supposed to be on uh, paying for uh, the, the school pensions. This is just the school pensions. The uh, state employees are similar situation, but again, this is, these numbers are easy to get at. Um, shows what, how much the pension uh, payments are supposed to escalate over the next few years. One thing that happened, there were a combination of factors that have like led to our pension debt, and uh, one thing was that the benefits were increased uh, about a decade ago, and then, and then also, the amount of payments that were made into the system uh, due to the economy doing well, the state and schools paid less into the system over time, and then we had the recession and there were massive investment losses. Uh, and the combination of those three things made a very large unfunded liability, and the state has to figure a way to put money back in. Uh, you know, certainly for the employees of both the state employees and school employees, they had money taken out of their paycheck, every every paycheck to go into this in retirement system. So, you know, they paid their part in um, looking at the state. The state has had a payment holiday for quite a while, and it gets very expensive to, uh, to repay that. One thing the governor is proposing in this budget uh, is to scale back the state's payments uh, in the next few years uh, to make it more affordable, quote unquote, for the state to be able to pay these payments, uh, but it ends up costing more money down the road. There's going to be a pension session after this that's going to talk about a lot of these issues. Um, the line in red shows what the governor is proposing in this budget. Uh, and so for 2014-15, it scales back. Instead of paying about $1.5 billion is what would normally be required for the system, in state dollars from the general fund, it ends up being um, 
like it's $1.1 billion. So about $400 million less than what they would normally pay. Um, there's also, he's also proposing a one-time transfer from the Tobacco Settlement Fund of $225 million to help pay for that payment in the school employees pension system only. Uh, so that brings that, the overall payment to $1.3 billion this year. So still, you know, $200 million less than what would be paid normally. Um, you know, this has happened before back in 2010-11. Uh, uh, under Governor Rendell, there was $121 million that was transferred from the Tobacco Settlement Fund into the state's pension, into the school employees pension fund. But that was a time when it was during the recession, tax revenues were really tight. That's not really the case right now. Um, so in the next few years, if, if, if this goes through, this is called changing the collars and what the state pays, how much they can increase over time. Uh, the state pays less for the next three or four years than they would normally, and then after that they pay more. So it's kind of like making half of a credit card payment. It's cheaper right now. Over time it ends up being more expensive, and particularly if you add up all the money because we're paying, um, you know, it's just going to be less interest and everything like that to be able to make that up. Um, next slide, please. Uh, also within the Department of Education, uh, a number of other things that are happening this year uh, due to increase in the amount of funding that's available. Uh, one thing that's important is there's no basic education increase in this. That's the first time that's happened in a number of years. Uh, there's a new program called the Ready to Learn Block, Block Grant that's uh, being proposed by Governor Corbett. Uh, it's going to be added to the accountability block grants, but it has a different funding formula, I think, for uh, sending that out to school districts. Uh, $241 million is going to be in that program. $25 million in uh, new uh, grants from FIA to uh, help uh, low and middle income Pennsylvanians uh, pay for college. A $10 uh, million hybrid learning program that would help, uh, it would blend traditional and digital learning in the classroom, and so that money would go out to uh, specific school districts. Special education sees a 2% increase in this budget, um, which we haven't seen in, I believe, six years. Uh, increases in early childhood programs, uh, in, including early intervention and uh, pre-K counts. Uh, those see an increase in this budget. Um, also is the moratorium on school, uh, new, school uh, new school construction projects um, is being proposed to be extended for another year. The amount of funding for these school projects is flat funded as what it was this last year. Uh, with this, the schools haven't, since 2012, haven't been able to seek reimbursement from the state for uh, part of school construction costs, and there's this backlog of construction projects that are building up, and it's making it difficult for school districts. Uh, next slide, please. This looks at, this is a slide from the administration about how the Ready to Learn block grants, what they can be used for. The money gets sent out to uh, schools based on, um, on a formula. How, based on how you can use it, though, it depends on what the performance is within the school district. And there, there are going to be four tiers that would be set up based on uh, school performance. And the better performing your school, the more latitude the school district has in using the funding. Uh, so uh, going from left to right, uh, this, is, this is also available in the budget. Uh, it just looks at the different programs you can use it for. So if you're a lower performing school, the state says you can only spend it on these three or four programs. But if, if, you are, if you know, you're better performing, you can use it for a lot more things. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this looks at what's happened to pre-K through 12 funding over time, including federal stimulus dollars and the state pension payments. Um, the bars in blue are regular pre-K through 12 spending, less any contribution in the state pension system. The, uh, orange, the yellow uh, bars are the, the temporary stimulus dollars that replace state dollars in two of the fiscal years. And then the gray at the top are the state's pension payments. Uh, looking at this over time, we see that you know, during the recession, we received era funding. The state was able to increase spending on pre-K through 12 uh, programs. Once that went away, the amount of funding for these programs was cut. Uh, at the same time, the pension payments increased during that period. And we've seen increases in both since then, but the pension uh, increases have been larger than the increases in, in the rest of pre-K through 12 spending. One thing that's interesting is there's been a lot of talk about, well, has there been cuts from, pre, have there been cuts from uh, education spending since before the recession, whether you want to count the error or not? Well, if you, take out the pen, if you take out the pension contributions and look at spending on everything else, um, spending in 2008-9 on pre-K through 12 was still higher than what we are in this proposed budget, even with the increases in it. So um, 
that's just uh, something we've been dealing with for a number of years. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the issues with pre-K through 12 spending is Pennsylvania, compared to a lot of other sta uh, states, is unfortunately pretty cheap in how much it wants, what share of funding public education that comes from the state. Um, in Pennsylvania, this is from 2011, uh, Pennsylvania state dollars funded 34% of pre-K through 12 spending. The national average was 45%. Um, in, at the national level, it's pretty much an even split between local dollars and state dollars on funding schools. Pennsylvania has a much larger reliance on local funding for our schools. Uh, that has a lot of ramifications for uh, education policy. It has a lot of ramifications for our, uh, what kind of education our kids get. Um, wealth is not very evenly distributed across the state. Uh, so when you rely more on uh, local funding, you end up having bigger differences in how much is avail you know, what it, what's available for um, educating our kids. And um, so we had like the 47th highest uh, state share in this country, so only three states had less state dollars as a share of overall funding, and we're eighth highest in our local share. So that's, that's a problem that's historic in Pennsylvania and is like, not likely to change anytime soon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of higher education, uh, we've seen uh, since, bef like right before the recession, there were a number of cuts to the amount of funding coming from state government for our higher education system. Uh, since 2008-9, uh, our state funding for our colleges is 21% lower than what it was back in 2008-9. Um, this has ramifications for you know people sending their kids to college, tuition's higher. Uh, Pennsylvania ends up being ranked recently as the number two state in per capita uh, student loan debt in the United States. So this is you know this is a decision that we make, a policy decision we make in Pennsylvania about what we feel is important. Uh, next slide, please. And you know comparing what we spend in, on pre, on uh, higher education, which is 1.6 billion dollars in this in the governor's proposed budget, comparing that to prisons. The Department of Corrections were proposing to spend two billion dollars on that, so we're spending quite a bit, you know, four hundred million dollars more on uh, pe keeping people in prison than we are on educating our kids that, in colleges. Um, again, you know, certainly corrections is a mandated cost for the state, and it's very important that we do that. It's just that more funding is going, you know, m over time, more and more funding has been going for that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the federal stimulus, this is a question that's been going on for since we received the federal stimulus about like what's going on with that. Um, one thing, you know, when the federal stimulus went away after 2000 in 2011-12, uh, immediately the dollars in the Department of Corrections were replaced. Uh, it's a mandated cost; the state has to do it. So the state found a way to be able to replace that funding. So immediately they replaced every dollar that we had in stimulus dollars with with state dollars. Within medical assistance, about 80% of the dollars that we lost in, in the change of the FMAP percentage from the federal government were replaced in that very first year. Uh, since then, more, they've been more than replaced. It's 128% in those same line items that received ERA funding. Uh, if you look at basic education, uh, it's a different story. In the basic education funding line uh, received an ERA cut. Uh, um, only 60% of those dollars were replaced in that first year. Since then, even with the increases that we've seen over the last three or four years, uh, the basic education is still only 76% of that original cut has been, the money that we received from ERA has been, uh, has been funded with new state dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Um, looking at what's happened with prison costs, this is a, another big cost driver in the state's budget. Um, we see prison costs increasing by 4%. Uh, one thing that's really positive in this budget that we've seen for the last couple of years, but uh, it, it's a little bit accelerated in this one, is the, the prison population starting to fall. Uh, it falls by 2% over about 1,000 inmates in this uh, budget. Unfortunately, in terms of savings overall, uh, we're still not seeing the big savings in that, and the prison population is still very high compared to a lot of places. Um, the um, prison cost increased by $78 million, uh, and that's 4%. Um, the Department of Corrections uh, says that it costs them about $41,100 on average to uh, incarcerate a person each year. Uh, our prison population is about 48800 for next next year. Uh, so it's a lot of people and it's a lot of money per person. Um, one thing that was important that Secretary Wetzel had pointed out in his budget hearing was that, you know, the, what's in the, like how many people we have in prison 
it's a policy decision to a great extent. Uh, how we deal with certain, you know, what we do in terms of our laws on like a, who goes to prison, who doesn't go to prison, what kind of treatment they receive, et cetera. Um, he said that, you know, there have been one law that's been passed that would help them reduce prison population. Uh, and then in the last session, there were also four other bills that would increase the prison population. So, you know, on one hand, you're trying to cut, and on the other hand, you keep putting more people in. It's, it's hard to get the prison population to drop over time if that's what you keep doing. And that's a decision that the General Assembly is making, and that's something that we need to think about over time in particular. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one other thing that's in the, the state's budget is there's kind of a low-key rollout of the Governor's Healthy Pennsylvania program. Uh, there are not a lot of details in the budget document itself about this. Uh, yesterday, he re, uh, they released the application to the federal government for having their Healthy Pennsylvania plan, which would be like the state's alternative to uh, using Obamacare for ensuring uh, low-income uh, folks that don't qualify for Medicaid. Um, in this case, uh, the Healthy Pennsylvania plan, according to the, uh, according to the budget document, there would be about 605,000 new people, that newly eligible adults for um, Medicaid light coverage, but it would be through private insurers. This is similar to the plan that was done in Arkansas. Rather than having people be on, Medicaid, on the traditional Medicaid program that the state provides, uh, it would be through private insurers. Um, there are about 85,000 uh, adults that have, that have previously qualified for Medicaid, but for whatever reason hadn't signed up, that they expect that they're going to sign up under, under um, the combination of the, uh, uh, the Healthy Pennsylvania and the Affordable Care Act, because the two kind of work together. Uh, about 26,000 kids that formerly qualified for CHIP would be uh, included in this, the expansion of medical assistance also. Um, in general, about a 300 net new people are added to uh, help implement the, um, both of these programs in the Department of Public Welfare. Over, there are about 700 people that are hired to do implementation increases, and then there's a loss of about 300 people in, uh, in other areas within the department. It assumes $2 billion of new funding coming from the federal government uh, to help pay for this and about $125 million of savings within state programs from being able to move people from one existing state programs to other state programs where it costs the state less money. Uh, one thing about the program is it, it, this Healthy Pennsylvania uh, application requires federal approval. There are a number of provisions in it that uh, people are, have been uncomfortable with, and it, it would be, it was described in the a newspaper article in the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, this morning as uh, the most radical of the um, applications that have been submitted to the federal government in terms of a state alternative to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so we don't know what's going to happen with that or what the time period is for that program to be approved. The budget assumes that it's approved and everything rolls out the way that it's expected to from the administration standpoint. It's, it's unclear about how realistic that really is and what happens, what happens to the budget, particularly in the Department of Public Welfare, if that's not the case and the program has to be changed. So I think this is kind of like a first step in that and it's certainly probably not going to be the way it ends up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one thing that's, uh, that was in the budget was that there's a, a program that the state's had for a number of years for Medicaid for uh, person, working persons with disabilities. That program's eliminated in this budget and the people who are covered under what's called MAUD uh, get transferred into the regular um, MA program. There are about 33,000 people that qualify for this currently. The benefits they receive are uh, pretty specific and help them with, particularly people with severe disabilities, be able to receive services that they need and still be able to work. And there's some other changes, that, there's some other differences in the program um, in terms of income limit and uh, what kind of coverage options there are that traditional Medicaid doesn't have. Rolling them into the regular Medicaid program for some of the people is going to be very difficult in terms of they're either going to make too much money and won't qualify for benefits anymore, or they're not going to be able to work anymore because the fear of loss of the benefits that they need just to have regular health care, uh, it, it's going to be difficult to see how that's going to work out with this, with this change. Uh, next slide. One of the ways that Healthy PA ends up saving money um, is because it ends up rolling back coverage that the state has, Pennsylvania's Medicaid coverage has been better than uh, other states in a number of areas over last a number of years. 
And Healthy Pennsylvania rolls a lot of those back to kind of federal minimums. And that's how the state saves money, but it ends up being more costly for individuals. Um, and the coverage is not quite as good. Um, in the regular MA program uh, the, that the state's offered for years, 2.2 uh, million Pennsylvanians are expected to be covered under that in 2014-15. Um, the budget increases by $249 million, or 4.9%, to $5.3 billion for the entire program. Uh, one of the reasons for the increase in cost for the state is this: there's a federal match of Medicaid dollars, and it gets recalculated uh, periodically. It got recalculated this last year, and Pennsylvania um, had its FMAP percentage from the federal government rolled back from 53.5% to 51.8%. So the state has to make up the difference on that, and that ends up being a fair amount of money. Um, and then also, within the state long, state's long-term care funding, overall it increases by about $150 million in this budget, but more of those costs are pushed into the uh, lottery fund and the tobacco settlement fund. The general fund saves about $50 million by doing so. Um, next slide, please. In terms of human services, uh, about 10, there's a 10% increase in both domestic violence and, and the rape crisis programs. These programs have not seen funding increases in a number of years. That's very welcome news. These are very important programs. Uh, the, the governor has had, in the last several budgets, has made a lot of effort on trying to reduce waiting lists for uh, programs for people with intellectual disabilities, autism, and uh, other programs. This uh, budget continues that. That's something uh, like a thousand people on various waiting lists are moved into are moved off the waiting list and start to receive services under this budget. Um, you know, while um, while that that's great, and I, and I think that's something that the state really needs to work on. Uh, one question that comes from this, uh, you know, it certainly provides families hope that are on these, uh, and. Uh, the one question, though, is like, what's going to happen for providers in terms of reimbursement rates, if they're going to be able to afford to take on these larger caseloads, and what's going to happen? I think in seeing the application from the federal government to the federal government on what the Healthy PA plan is going to answer some of those questions, but right now we really don't know. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of other programs, uh, there are a lot of other programs we can talk about, but I'm just going to talk about a couple. Um, in terms of environmental programs, the uh, We've seen a lot of shifting from the general fund to other funds in the last several years uh, in terms of the Parks Department, uh, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, which runs our parks and forest land. Uh, more and more funding for parts for operating our state forests and our state parks is being paid for out of the oil and gas lease fund now. So royalties that come in for, from gas wells uh, on state lands are used to pay for that. Not at, with this budget, it would be $4. For every one dollar of state general funds that are used to pay for our state parks and forests, there are four dollars that are coming from the oil and gas lease fund that creates some interesting incentives for uh, running our state parks. Uh, next slide. So in terms of how does it get paid for? So we have this big funding gap, billion dollars. Uh, we don't have any new tax increases in this budget. So what ends up happening? How is this done? One way is through what looks to be fairly optimistic revenue estimates. Uh, the 4.9 percent growth is, uh, you know, a, a lot higher than what we've seen this year. Uh, it presumes that the economy really picks up in 2014 and 2015 versus what it is now. There are there are some reasons to think the revenue growth would be higher, uh, going from four, going from 1.6 to 4.9. That, that remains to be seen, and I think that's something we're going to see over time. Compared to like a 3% revenue growth, that's about $550 million extra that that adds to the, uh, to the budget, they would be able to fund things. So that's part of it. Another part of it is changing the collars uh, for state pensions. That gives the state about $170 million in the general fund that they wouldn't have if they don't change the collars. That tween, that's between the difference between the state um, employees and the school employees, so that's the, those two together. There's a one-time transfer of uh, funding from the oil and gas lease fund uh, for leasing new um, New oil, new oil and gas wells on state land. Uh, the this is chain, this uh, probably violates the moratorium that was been put in place on uh, no new drilling on state lands. Uh, the administration says that there's not going to be any surface disturbance from these uh, new wells. That remains to be seen what that actually means. Um, but the money that comes for signing these lease bonuses goes into the general fund rather than into the. Um, into the oil and gas lease fund. This was done before the last time the state did a big round of leasing, uh, but again, that was during the recession. 
uh, when tax revenues were very hard to come by, this is kind of a different story. Um, there's also the one-time payment of tobacco settlement funds into the pension system that saves the um, general fund $225 million. And then the change in the unclaimed property law is $150 million, the one-time bump in revenue. That's been done before also. Most of these things have been done before. This budget's unusual because they're all being done at the same time. And the one thing is once you get this revenue this one time, next year we're kind of in the same place that we are uh, currently. We don't have these, these sources. Next slide, please. So again, you know, where does that lead us? Uh, we're kind of at a place that starting, you know, we get through this budget with these one-time revenue sources, and then we go to next year, and where are we? We're probably in a worse state than where we are now. Next slide, please. You know, pension costs are going to continue to grow. We're going to have to have more money to be able to pay for those. Uh, revenue growth continues to be slow. Um, it's, un, you know, if the revenue doesn't end up meeting expectations this next fiscal year, that means that probably they're going to be slower the next year after that. Um, over time, we've seen uh, uh, cuts across administrative things within the, the state. Uh, it makes it harder for them to provide services in an effective manner. You know, things like the state library. I use the state library to get data. Um, they're open a couple days a week. They, they used to be open all the time. You get data requests from various people in uh, departments. It takes longer uh, for them to be able to answer questions, um, even if you do get an answer. Uh, it just, it, it, over time, it makes it very difficult to run the state efficiently. And then also, you know, it makes the state more reliant on trying other things besides taxes or, uh, you know, increasing spending to uh, be able to fund state government. So that means more things like privatization, asset sales, um, more dependence on gambling revenues, more dependence on gas drilling to help balance the state budget. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, you know, why is this happening? You know, is it we have a bad economy, you know, spend too much in state government, Snow, Obamacare, whatever. Um, are these the reasons why we have these problems? I don't think so. Next slide, please. Uh, one, one thing that we've seen over time is just the increase in, in corporate tax cuts. And I think that that's really made balancing the state budget and paying for critical services difficult over time. Next slide. Uh, even while this budget doesn't have any tax increases in it specifically, or tax cuts in it specifically, there are a number that have, there have numbered them in past and previous years that take effect this year and have, you know, a pretty mo uh, like a pretty sizable impact this year, and then they grow over time. Those include um, changes in the state's capital stock and franchise tax. That rate got cut in January 1st. It gets cut again uh, January 1st, 2005, and then it's eliminated 2016. And there's no revenue replacement for that tax. It was over a billion dollars a few years ago, and that's just gone. Um, in the corporate net income tax, the net operating loss uh, allowance has increased. Uh, in 2014 and 2015, the impacts from that really don't start to happen in terms of revenue until this year and next year. Uh, there are a number of tax credits that the state's passed in the last few years that are passed. Currently, the year that they're passed, they don't have any impact on that budget. Um, but in future years, they take effect, and then we start losing tax revenue for that. You know, lawmakers get to say, well, we passed a tax cut. You know, we can balance our budget this year. Down the road, it ends up being a problem, and these things are already in the books, and we've got to figure out how we're going to do that. And then also there were, uh, you know, there's another program that has uh, redevelopment uh, for third-class cities. You know, it helps uh, people redevelop inner, inner cities of places like Harrisburg, Allentown. Well, Harrisburg's not eligible for the program. Uh, Allentown, uh, Lancaster, and uh, Bethlehem got the first round of these uh, tax credits. What ends up happening is that the state, uh, if you create a zone um, and you build this redevelopment in there, all the taxes that are collected in that zone are used to help pay for the bonds for paying for this private development. And while you get redevelopment, and it's great for the cities, it's, it's pretty expensive for the state, and I think we don't really have a handle on how expensive it is for the state. Um, the, the one that was done in Allentown was supposed to cost about $20 million a year. The first few years that it's gone through, the budget that was just released, buried in it, is like there's a number that's $43 million in lost state tax revenue just this year. And there's going to be a hockey arena there that's going to all the, all the revenue that would be generated from that also doesn't get collected by the state anymore. It gets, uh, goes to the developer. So that's going to get even more expensive. Um, looking at 2014-15, just these programs listed here, it's $130 million in lost revenue versus what we collected the year before. Uh, by the time we get to 18-19, it's $700 million. And these are just some of the cuts that have been done. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
What we've seen with corporate tax revenue over time is, uh, with the number of cuts that we've seen, is that this is kind of the third leg of the state's tax revenue system. We have personal income tax, uh, sales tax, and corporate taxes are kind of the main three areas that we get taxes. Um, cor the corporate taxes have been cut and cut and cut, and now, uh, even in an expanding economy, when you see personal income tax growth in three or four percent a year, more than that, uh, four percent growth in sales tax, and corporate taxes in, in total are declining. It, it's not like a huge decline, but it's still a decline. We're talking at a time that the economy is expanding. And as this happens over time, then when you became more and more dependent on these other taxes to increase to be able to um, pay for government services. And that's just pretty difficult. Uh, next slide, please. And we've seen these, the cost of these increase over time. This starts looking at uh, taking a point in time of 2003 for what the capital stock and franchise tax rate was, and then what tax cuts were on the books, business tax cuts were on the books at that point, and then measuring what's happened to them since. Back in 2003-04, these uh, cuts cost about $800 million. Uh, they're now over $3 billion a year that we lose uh, from what we would collect if they weren't in place. And then this grows to $4 billion by the time we get four or five years out. A lot of that has to do with the blue bar on this is the cost of, of getting rid of the capital stock and franchise tax. Again, that was a billion dollars just a couple years ago. Um, if we were back at the rate that we, were, that we had back in 2003-04, you know, we'd have another, right now we would have you know, another $2.5 billion that we, would be in the state budget. Uh, <coughs> next slide, please. And these figures are from the Independent Fiscal Office of what they projected revenue growth to be over the next few years. Um, in general, we, we see pretty moderate growth in most of the tax areas, 4.4% in personal income tax, 3.7% in uh, sales tax, um, and then total revenues growing by 2.9% over this time. The, the overall revenue growth in the state budget is uh, it, it's constricted by the loss of state ta of corporate tax revenue. During this time period, they're expected to decrease an average of 1.5 percent per year. Uh, so, if if corporate taxes just grew at the average rate of other taxes, uh, we would see revenue overall revenue growth being 3.8 percent rather than 2.9. That's a pretty big difference, and over t particularly over time. Next slide, please. Well, and the one issue with this is, you know, what if if this is something that's done to, uh, you know, is, is it effective at what, it's, what the aims of the program are? Um, and what we've seen is we've been doing these corporate tax cuts for a number of years, and the evidence that these things are doing what we want them to do, you know, people talk about jobs all the time. What are they doing to our job growth? Um, you know, it's not a direct linkage, but this is as good as we have as a measure of, like, do these things really work or not? And we've been doing a lot of tax cuts. And during the recession, you know, Pennsylvania's job growth rank did pretty well. Pennsylvania actually uh, hemorrhaged fewer jobs than the rest of the country. But then since the, since the end of the recession, we've seen our job growth go back to the, being one of the worst states in the country at this, going 41st, 43rd, and uh, 48th in the current year. Uh, so if these tax cuts are really working and really effective at luring companies to the state and employing more people, it's not showing up in the job numbers. Uh, next slide, please. So what do we do to go forward? You know, we're at a place, you know, every year budgets are a decision point. Um, where, where do we go from here? How do we make things better than what's being planned out? Next slide, please. You know, we've been beating this drum for a number of years. Um, we had some success at this, but it's, uh, you know, I think we really need to take a balanced approach at looking at our state budget. We need to find new revenues and to find sensible program cuts to be able to pay for critical services that we need. Uh, we need to have sustainable revenue options put on the table and enacted. Not you know, one-time revenues are okay if you really need to get through one year or if there's one very specific thing. But we're not in that situation right now, and I think we know we have problems going forward. One-time revenues aren't really going to help us get to where we need to go over time. And it's going to make us harder. If we keep using one-time revenues, it's going to get that much harder to balance our budget year in and year out. Uh, we need to take a look at corporate tax breaks that we've already enacted and scale those back if they're not being effective. And then stop, the one thing is stop making new holes in the budget and uh, in the bucket. And I think that we've seen that, you know, they're not new proposals this year. There's still other proposals that are going to cost us a lot of money over time. Got it. So again, uh, these are a list of some of the things we've been talking about, you know, rolling back the capital stock and franchise tax, 
rate uh, to uh, still a very low rate compared to what it's been, uh, having a real severance tax. Um, we, there was a, in last year's budget, there was a, an attempt to close corporate tax loopholes. I think we could do a lot better than what was uh, done last year. It was a great step they actually took to do that. And then also considering some sort of 1% tax, like a tax on, um, on the more wealthy in the state in terms of investment income, something like that. Pennsylvania has a flat tax, and other states have done better in terms of their revenues uh, by having a progressive tax, and we don't have one. So next slide. Um, this just looks at what happens with the severance tax over time. I'm going to talk about that later. Next slide, please. And if you want to take action, here, here are, uh, come, come to our website, uh, look at our, our blog address, and I am ready for questions if people have them. Next slide. Thank you for your time. A lot of information. So. Yes, we, we, ha we have microphones set up. Uh, this is on, this is being on TV, so. Well, they, they need to pick it up for, uh, it's being taped by PCN. So, um, Mike, what was the corporate tax rate back in, like, 1980 uh, compared to what it is now? I know education used to be 55% in the, in the 80s. Now it's 35. What is it for corporate tax, and does that make a difference? Uh, the share of the state budget that's paid for by corporate tax has been shrinking over time. Uh, back in 1980, I don't have the figures in front of me on that. Uh, but it was you know, well over 20% 15 years ago. So we, as that shrinks, other things have to pick up. Uh, yes? Uh, my name is Brendan uh, I'm Murray. I was on the school board in Harrisburg for two years. Um, education is always going to be a key for me. Um, so what I was wondering is, is what's the difference between the amount of money that we're spending per pupil, if you have any uh, idea, comparative to the amount of money that we're putting into, um, you know, the incarceration of our youth? Uh, I don't have the per pupil rates in front of me. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty big difference. So I, I can get that, I can get that and, and send that to you, certainly. Yes. Hi. Um, I promised um, Sharon I wouldn't yell about Medicaid, but um, <clears throat> a friendly question. Sure. Uh, I think something that DPW often does is talks, and the governor often talks about um, how we're so much more generous than, than other states. In actuality, what we are is inefficient um, in that we have a graying population mm -hmm. uh, that you and I can relate to. Um, and yet we have one of the highest levels of institutionalization in nursing homes of any state in the union when you just talk about percentages. Mm -hmm. When you put the percentages next to, that are over 50%, next to um, the, the higher elderly population that is probably demanding those things, um, you come up with an unsustainable number. Um, but tackling that problem, um, is the way to save money without hurting people um, and without cutting benefits to people who might otherwise be able to subsist, uh, to, to exist on their own. And I think that that's something that we need to talk about because the governor frequently talks about, oh, Medicaid unsustainable mm -hmm. and he gets a lot of traction with that. Nobody really knows what that means. What it means really is that we've got more, we've got 53 percent of the people that need some kind of assistance going into nursing homes when most states are down in the 30s and 40s. Um, and it takes nine months to get an application for a home and community-based waiver approved. Wow. Um, whereas you can go into a nursing home today and, and be in your bed by this afternoon. Well, if you're coming out of a hospital with, say, a stroke or, or something like that, you can't wait nine months. Sure. Um, and that's where we're flushing money down the drain. Um, and the only one who profits from that are the nursing, is the nursing home industry, which is, of course, a big supporter of the governor's plan because they do very well with this. It's a good points. Good points. And I, I think that's something that we really need to look at over time. And I think in, in terms of, you know, how, how we pay for this. And, you know, obviously one thing that's interesting the IFO does is they really look at, like, demographic factors in Pennsylvania. The grain of Pennsylvania is something that's going to be, you know, going forward a big impact on our budget. And that's, that's a great area. Okay. Thank you. Sharon, I didn't yell. Thank you. Uh, 
Sure. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Richard. That's um, a really important point. Um, secondly, this is, may seem like a small point, but we talk about the importance of jobs and creating jobs. And you mentioned the MOD, the Medical Assistance for Workers with Disabilities program, that's going to be eliminated under the governor's plan. Um, that program not only enables people to work, but it enables some people to qualify for waivers, which is a broad set of benefits that keeps them out of nursing homes. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really bad. The other thing is, one of the programs that you mentioned, um, home and community-based programs, is getting an increase is attendant care. The problem there is that there are two programs. One is a state-only program that has a growing waiting list. Those are primarily folks who are working and because of attendant care are able to work, none of the money of the increase is going to take them off the waiting list. So the attendant care waiting list is not being addressed, mm -hmm. number one. And number two, um, it, again, people who are working are going to give up jobs and, and family members are going to give up jobs because they're not seeing an increase in that program. Kind of a penny-wise and pound-foolish policy right. in some of those. Right. Yeah. So Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right, hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it.